Hi, I'm Smriti Chopra again, and uh, I'm your instructor for the GLUE lectures for the duration of this course. This is GLUE lecture two, and let's get into it. This lecture is titled Robot Models because this week you guys uh, focused a lot on different models for you know, robots specifically. And as usual, pay attention because this lecture will help you guys with quiz two. Okay, with that. So we saw it this week in Dr. Eggerstead's lectures that he introduced two models for the robots. That's your robot. And then one model was um, with respect to, you know, the angular velocities of the wheels of the robot, which is the differential drive uh, model. And then another model that we saw was with respect to this, you know, V and omega um, inputs. So why these two different models or why, why is it that, you know, we have a one model that's actually your angular rates and the other model that's your V and omega. Well, he went over it and he explained to you guys that, you know, this differential drive model, which is actually the one that is uh, used in, with the robot or actually the model for the robot, it's a two-wheel differential drive thing, is very important because when you're implementing your controller onto the robot, you have to use the correct model. It has two wheels, so obviously you need to give it inputs with, for both the wheels. But when we are designing our control law, or when we are designing our controls, in that time we don't want to, you know, think in terms of wheel velocities, etc. We'd rather just think in terms of, you know, okay, me walking and I'm walking with a linear velocity and an angular velocity. And it's kind of much easier than, you know, thinking about each wheel and how it turns, etc. So we have these two models here the differential drive and the simpler model which is used for design. Okay, so I just want to show you guys this uh, model in action or you know this whole thing of how you design controllers based on a different model and then you use something else for implementation and that's, watch this video, it's a really interesting video, it's my work and it's robots playing music and they're playing Beethoven's Furelies actually. Uh, the point here that I want to make is that all the control that is designed for this, these robots is done using the model, the simplified model that we saw, the V Omega model. But then when you're implementing it onto these robots, I'm actually uh, converting my V and Omega into, you know, angular velocities for each robot and that's the input that they are getting here. So in front of our eyes, it's a differential drive robot and that's how we're doing it. Okay, so how do you do that? If you really simplify and see, this was my robot and basically what I'm saying is, you know, you go from point A to point B in time 10 seconds. This is a simple thing, you know, here this, at this point it's playing note A on the piano and here it's playing some G sharp or something, let's say, on the floor piano and it needs to go from here to here in 10 seconds, right? That is the basic problem for one robot if you really simplify it. Okay, this is the model I'm using, like I said to calculate my V and omega to make them actually do this as how, however, whatever trajectory they take, straight line, move like this, whatever they're doing, this input that I'm giving them is based off the model uh, shown here, which is a high level task and then control design is done here. But then the commands that I'm going to be sending to the robots are going to be found using this model, which was the differential drive model. You guys have seen all this before. Okay, what is what happens is when you use this guy and this guy together, you can actually derive these equations. So all I'm saying is that I'm going to find V comma omega based on this guy and then I'm going to convert it and put it into this equation here to get VR and VL, which is what then I'm going to send to the robots. And that's exactly what you saw in that um, music playing robots thing as well. So, okay, that's one model to another. And an intuitive example, let's go really quick over it. Uh, let's say my velocity input that I'm giving to my robot is zero and my omega or my angular velocity is constant. What are the corresponding angular velocities? So again, V and omega is what I have found out. But when I send the commands to the robots, I'm gonna find VR and VL using these equations right here, right? So when you plug this stuff in, you see that, okay, VR is going to be this value here, VL is going to be this value here, where C is just some constant, which is actually an omega. Okay, now intuitively, do you understand what's happening here? 
let's see my robot, let's assume it's a point, and I'm saying that, you know, it's not going straight at all, it's just going to keep moving, you know, on its own. Like, I'm saying that my velocity is zero, but my omega is constant, so I have a constant angular velocity. Okay, that means that my robot is not moving it forward, it's just spinning in place. And that makes sense because now what we found out in terms of, you know, right and left wheel angular velocities, one is simply the negative of the other. So one wheel is getting, let's say, plus five and the other is getting negative five. So they're just going to, it's going to make the robot spin in place. It's not going to make it go forward at all. So that was the whole intuitive example. But basically, you guys should be pretty comfortable in going between this, you know, mapping or transformation from V omega to V R V S. Okay, with that, now back to our musical board. So, you guys remember this, of course you do, which happened two slides ago. This musical board example, my robot having to go from A to B in, let's say, 10 seconds. Now I want to go a little deeper into the control. So earlier we, when we showed the mapping between, you know, V and omega and V, R, V, L, V, assumed that somehow magically I already had V and omega, right? Now I want to go a little deeper and say, okay, this whole finding the control, V and omega, based on the model that I said, um, how, what does it actually mean? This is the model I have. And now I'm asking you guys this, that, Let's make it really simple. My robot is here and it's looking also in this direction, okay? It needs to go from here to here. Let's say even my theta is perfect. It's already looking here. It wakes up at A. It needs to reach at in 10 seconds. So why can't I just say, guess what? Omega can be zero and V can be B minus A over 10, right? And we know, all of us know from physics, geometry, from the model, etc., that if I was to give my robot this velocity and this omega at every time instant for 10 seconds, I, can, I will in fact reach this point over here. It's simple math, right? So why don't we do that? Why do we make such a big deal about, oh, we have to design the control, V, omega, etc.? Like, is this what the robot is doing actually in that music video that we just saw, etc.? Well, the answer is no. Why? Because we don't live in a perfect world. So in our world of simulation, this would be perfect. Yeah, sure. In my computer and in my, you know, mind, it works perfectly. But actually, when I put it onto the robots, what's going to happen is there will be friction. There will be other problems. Maybe my wheels don't move at the same rate that they should. Or maybe, you know, the encoders are slightly off. Or maybe I come and kick the robot off while it's moving. Whatever. I need to know that, let's say, while I'm moving here, I wear off slightly, my V and omega at this point needs to know that I have gone off the path. In other words, we need to have feedback. If there is no feedback of where I am in the world, then, then it's so easy for me to just wear off because of, you know, problems like friction, etc., when I'm actually moving the robot. And then my V and omega has no idea that I've worn off. So let's say while walking, I come here, I'll just keep going straight instead. I'm not doing any kind of, you know, feedback on, on how I should be moving. So this, I think, is a very key concept in controls that, and kind of motivates why it is that we need state information or we need feedback or even all the stuff that you studied about, you know, PID regulators, PI, everything. You, when you're minimizing the error, you need feedback, you need output, you need to know where you are in order to find even the error, or how far you are from what you need to be doing. For all this. Feedback is a very important thing that you need. So hopefully with all this, I have kind of explained to you guys the motivation behind why you need to know where you are in the world. And uh, as you saw in the lectures, uh, Dr. Eger said goes over this whole thing of wheel encoders, right? That if you have wheel encoders, you will <clears throat> be able to measure where you are. Okay, for that, again, real quick, this is how the wheel encoders work. Each encoder has n ticks and uh, a total of n ticks. That means if you go over all n ticks, you would have moved one revolution on the wheel, which is 2 pi r on, you know, your distance. And then you have dl, dr, dc. What is dl, dr, dc? It's basically how much your uh, wheel is moving or how much distance or the distance of this arc, for example, uh, based on the number of ticks. So if I've gone five ticks, how much did I move? What is this distance that's given by dl, dr, dc? You've seen all this before. And then, okay, once we have this, so this is what, you know, the wheel encoders give us, now what? How do we find where we are in space? 
okay, I know where I am in the beginning. Let's say I, this is where I wake up. And now I use dl dr dc in this form, in this update equation, and now I get my new position x prime, y prime, and phi prime. So, and I, remember, x, y, and phi is my state or where I am in place, like x, y, and looking there, that kind of a thing. Okay, cool. So this whole thing is the wheel encoders. This is how they work. So just for your general you know, knowledge or curiosity, if you are wondering where did this model come from, well, we can go back to our you know, concepts in physics really quick and we can be like, all right, if this is a circle, this is me walking on the circle with radius small r here. Um, and I have a speed of, let's say, you know, some v, linear speed. Well, I must also have some angular velocity right, for me to be walking on this circle, otherwise I would just keep walking straight. So how do these three variables kind of, you know, match up? So there's this very famous formula, V is equal to omega R, that kind of relates the fact that if somebody is walking or if you're tracking this point on a circle of radius R, how does the linear velocity, which is V, and the angular velocity, which is omega, uh, relate to one another? And now if I wanted to see how much distance I have moved in, let's say, time delta t, well, what I'm simply going to do is I'm going to say multiply this with my speed and my distance then becomes omega r delta t. That's the distance moved. And I want you guys to like kind of understand that the same concept can be thought of in terms of the each wheel of the robot. So if my angular velocity for each wheel is vr and my radius is r, I can actually calculate the distance moved as r times vr times dt. And from here, I'm going to let you guys figure out how it is that we uh, reach this model. And as hints, I'm going to say, OK, we already found out how we got this. We know this as our model for the robot. And now can we do something to you know, kind of get this equation using the update law that we know that if we ever want to find the position at the next time instance, we simply say position at previous plus x dot times dt. So it's a nice exercise. Find out how we get this model, and then um, all is good. With that, let's go to the next example. So this is an odometry example. Um, just to kind of you know make it again really clear the concept of wheel encoders. Um, again, very important for the quiz. So let's say my robot starts at the origin. When I say origin, I mean my position and orientation both is zero. And it is located after 0.1 seconds is what you have to find out. Where is it? And now it's given that your left wheel or your right wheel records 10 ticks, your left wheel records 6 ticks, blah, blah, blah. All this stuff is given. How would you do it? OK, these are the set of equations that you're going to use. First, because you know the number of ticks, you're going to find out how much each wheel has moved based on these equations right here, right? And then you're going to use them in this update law to find out finally where your x, y, and phi land up. And a real quick note just for my satisfaction here is that it's nice to wonder if I'm the robot or if I have the robot, I know the input I'm giving it. I know the angular velocities I'm giving it, right? So why can't I myself find out through my model, which is this, right, this guy here, why don't I find out by updating using this where my next position is going to be based on just my VR and VL? Why is it that I'm using the encoder in the first place? Like, why don't I just simulate based on my inputs where I'm going to be in the next thing, uh, time instant? Well, that's exactly the point that we were trying to make here, that even though I'm giving it a certain input, I don't know that it's actually going to be doing that. So when I update my equation, I don't want to do it based solely on the model. I actually want to get feedback, physical feedback from the robot, and that's how I want to update my equation. And that's why we do this whole encoder thing instead of just simply saying, you know what, I'm going to find it myself through my update equation because I know the input I'm giving, and I'm going to find out where my x, y, and phi land up. No. That's why we don't want to do this. We want feedback. We want to see if it actually translated into that much motion or not. That's why we use the encoders. And with that, 